and uh, thank you uh, to the organizer for the invitation, especially uh, Professor Carlotto and Professor Marquez. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, so the title of my talk is More Theoretic Aspects of the World More Energy. And so the, the general idea is to, uh, is to study the space of immersions that I will write uh, immersions of sigma into Rn when sigma is a closed Riemann surface. Um, by, the, by using a, a MOS function, uh, that, and I will write a quasi-MOS function because we'll see we cannot quite get a MOS function, a quasi-MOS function. Which means that uh, we are looking from the, for a function L, which will go from the space of immersions into, uh, into R which should be some kind of measure of the complexity of the immersion. And so it should be also invariant under transformations which do not change the immersion geometrically. So we're looking for that L should be invariant under translations, rotations, and, uh, and dilations. So now if I assume that the ambient dimension of is equal to 3, then uh, you can define the principal curvatures, uh, k1, uh, k2. It's principal curvatures. I think it goes back as far to Euler. And, uh, and then we can define two natural quantities, which are the Gauss curvature. So it's a product of the curvatures. Gauss curvature and uh, an H, which is the mean curvature. And by the, the first invari the third invariance at the under dilations, we want to integrate a quadratic quantity in the principal curvatures. So we have essentially two choices. So the integral of uh, of k, that is I take some immersion into R3 and I write g, the pullback metric. But we know that this is a constant independent of, of the immersion. And the second one is integral of the mean curvature to the square. And this is what we call the Wilmore energy although it was already in the work of Germain and Poisson from the uh, beginning of 20th, 19th century. And, and so the general um, question that we might ask with this perspective is uh, take some regular class of homotopy of immersions and take gamma to be non-trivial. And then we can define the mean max width. So we look at all infimum of the supremum of the Wilmer energy. And, uh, and so I don't know who asked the first these questions, but uh, um, you can also look uh, to a paper of Riviere in 2015, where he first considers this problem and gets some new results about realization of these widths. And so we might want to ask, um, can we estimate them? And uh, two, can we realize them? And uh, also for, uh, for simple uh, examples of uh, regular classes homotopy, can we actually compute and see uh, if we can completely solve this problem? And uh, the prototype of this, uh, of the general um, min max width would be to take uh, k is equal to 1, uh, sigma equal to s2, and n is equal to 3. <coughs> so if you take some, some class into the immersions of s2, uh, which by smell is z times z2, 
from now 60 years old. Um, then I define uh, beta 0 as, as follows here. And this number has another interpretation. And it's also due to smell. Uh, so it's also uh, smell. Uh, we showed that the, the space of, of immersions of S2 into R3 um, is pass connected. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, so it means that if we take, let's say, I is a standard embedding of S2 into R3, and I will write it like this. Uh, we'll say we, we choose some orientation um, here. And now I take the uh, minus i, minus i here, and uh, so it will have negative orientation. So I'm saying that there exists a pass, some phi t here, with uh, phi 0 equal to i, and phi 1 equal to minus i. And if I call omega, uh, the set of, of such paths, then once you do a sphere version, you can now um, do the same pass but reverted, and you get actually a generator of the, this fundamental group of immersions. So it means that beta 0 is also equal to, uh, to the infimum of such transformations. Uh, 0, 1. And uh, now let me let me give some example. I mean, let me argue that this uh, um, this this value of min max is non-trivial, and this is due to uh, we can get it first thanks of the Liao uh, inequality. Um, let me call the Liao inequality. So it's like 1983. Um, take any immersion into Rn, then, um, then the Wilmo energy of phi is, uh, is at least 4 pi times the number of pre-mages. And uh, by a theorem, classical theorem of Max and Benchoff from 1980. So we just need to, to read the, the title of the paper. It's called uh, every sphere aversion. So this is called the sphere aversion. This uh, this uh, transformation here, every sphere aversion, as a quadruple point. Quadruple point. So it implies that beta zero is at least sixteen pi, and one can also check that uh, the Wilma energy of the sphere is equal to four pi. So we get, uh, if we remember that classical uh, mountain pass, then it fits into this general framework. And it was uh, conjectured by, by Kirsner that we, we have equality. Um, so I should put something like beginning of 80s, uh, um, because it appeared um, before Brennan's paper was published, uh, that we have equality here. and. Uh, an optimal pass is uh, given by uh, Wilmore gradient flow. Of uh, Brian's minimal surface, of Brian's Wilmore surface, and I will discuss about it later. Um, so in the first part of the talk, we will give uh, examples and recall uh, Brian's classification. Uh, then uh, we'll speak about 
how can one realize the width uh, realizing uh, beta gamma, which is the work of Riviere. And in the last part, which would be essentially uh, uh, the second hour, we'll speak about Morse index bounds. So for now, I only spoke about uh, immersions from a closed surface. Uh, but uh, you see that if you allow uh, <coughs> open surfaces, uh, then uh, uh, if you take a minimal immersion, which is minimal, I mean, a complete minimal surface with finite curvature, I will define it in a minute. Uh, that is h is equal to 0. Then you can actually compactify the surface to get a, a Wilmer surface as previously um, because of uh, a, f a force, invari uh, force invariance of the Wilmer energy. So maybe if you recall in the talk of Paul, he said that for a generic uh, inversion, the Wilmer energy doesn't change. But if you take a point and you on the surface and you invert at this point, then you should consider something else, which is uh, the, this two form. So you have the gas curvature, and this is uh, pointwise, pointwise uh, conformally invariant. Which means that if phi is uh, the inversion of phi, then we get that uh, this uh, will more energy of. Uh, equal to, uh, to this one more energy. <coughs> and if we assume that this is finite, which is uh, equivalent to say that uh, phi has finite total uh, curvature, um, then phi is a uh, one more surface. Um, but in general, it may have branch points. I will come back to this later. Um, yeah, and also, uh, okay, maybe I should. Um, I can write here, uh, and uh, and also this uh, this integral. Um, it's a multiple of four pi, so it's or two pi, so it's the degree of the Gauss map if n is equal to three, or it's uh, two pi d for some uh, um, where n uh, is a Gauss map. So the energy is, uh, is always quantized by 4 pi, even in higher dimension. Because this term, if you put it on the other side, uh, it will, you will also get 4 pi. Um, it's also a consequence of the Liao inequality. Uh, it's a result of Kostner, for example, that uh, you have equality in the Wilmore energy if and only if you have an inversion of a minimal surface. And so here we see that it's a multiple of 4 pi. And uh, let me give another example which will be relevant in the following. Uh, if, you, if you look at now, uh, look at an immersion from sigma into Sn, uh, then you can also define the Wilmore energy. Uh, and this time you will have to add uh, the area. Um, um, then we have uh, the following uh, commutative diagram. That is, if pi, you take a stochastic projection into Rn um, with p, uh, which is not in the image, then the Wilmer energy in Rn of the composition is the same as the Wilmer energy in Sn. And uh, sorry, um, here. Uh, so in particular, compact minimal surfaces in SN, once they are stereographically projected, they give rise to uh, 
other uh, Wilmer surfaces. So we have a lot of examples. <laughs> and uh, now the next result I'd like to discuss is uh, the classification of Bryant, which says that if you take a general zero Wilmer surface in sweet space, then these are the only examples. take a a one more immersion uh, so okay uh, maybe I didn't say it but uh, <laughs> a one more immersion is a critical point of the one more energy uh, maybe I can add this here um, a one more uh, surface or immersion uh, there are the two terminologies in the literature um, and sometimes they won't be immersions, but still, uh, is uh, a critical point. Uh, point of W. OK, so B will more immersion. Uh, right. Um, then. Uh, there exists uh, a cartic holomorphic form Q of phi uh, such that so if Q of phi vanishes identically uh, then uh, then phi is the uh, inversion of a complete minimal surface, complete uh, minimal surface, uh, and then you should have some properties to have really an immersion with uh, embedded planar ends. And uh, let me make some remarks, and then I'll define what it means to have embedded planar ends. Um, yes, uh, let me make some remarks. Um, so first, uh, it will be used th through all the talk, but you see that if, if sigma is S2, then by riemann rohr theorem, Q phi is always identically equal to 0. So for general 0 and more surfaces in three space, they are the only examples. And now, uh, so what it means also, that the Wilmore energy of, of these guys is a multiple of 4 pi. Now I, I take phi from the sphere. And some values are forbidden. So d equal to 2, 3, 5, 7, 9. And d equal to 2d prime larger than 4. Uh, you have examples. And these guys are impossible. So this equal to 2 is clear because the only two-ended minimal surface genus 0 is a uh, catenoid by the result of rich chain. And, uh, and also 3, um, you can do it by hand. But then when it goes to 5 and 7 ends, uh, even direct computation with the Weierstrass parameterization is not enough. And so Bryant uh, introduced some, um, some algebraic uh, way to formulate this problem, which is called the Klein correspondence. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then it showed that there are no examples for 5 and 7. And you can check with these methods that 9 is also, uh, is also forbidden. And, but there, were, there have been some claims in the literature that there are examples with an odd number of ends larger than 9. But the Zervais transformation is just false. Uh, because you have this condition that uh, the orders of the, w of the zeros of the one form is a double of the, po the order of the poles of the Gauss map. And, uh, and there's just some. Uh, simplification uh, in, the, in the rational fraction, so it doesn't work. And so uh, up, to, uh, up to my knowledge, I mean, uh, there are no examples of with a odd number of 
uh, embedded planar ends. Okay. So there's also a result of Montiel in uh, in uh, in R4. Uh, he has the same re similar results, but we won't uh, use it. Yes. Okay. Um. So uh, this embedded planar ends. So by the Weierstrass parameterization, if you have uh, some conformal uh, into R three, I take uh, to be a complete uh, minimal surface. So with uh, you can write it. Uh, in a conformal coordinate, so I write z equal x1 plus x2. And uh, by conformal, I mean that dz phi, dz phi is equal to 0 when dz is a Cauchy Riemann operator minus i dx2. Um, so you can write it as follows. So, uh, so here it's near, uh, near pi. Uh, so in general, you would have some integer here, but uh, as you're embedded, it must be equal to 1. And then you have an additional term, uh, some logarithm of z plus something bounded, where here, uh, so a0 is in c3 minus 0, and gamma is in r3. And by uh, planar, we mean that gamma must be equal to 0, and if Gamma dif is different from zero. We say that uh, phi, uh, so psi, has a catenoid end. Right. Yeah. And you, you can you can check directly that if you take the inversion of, for example, the catenoid, it won't be a smooth immersion. A smooth immersion it will only be c one alpha for all alpha. And uh, and here it's really smooth that we we want. Uh, yeah, we'll do it like this. Okay, let me go to the second part of my talk, uh, which is how can we realize these widths? So maybe I should keep it. No, it's here, so it's fine. Uh, I can erase. So theorem. So it's theorem of Tristan Rivier from uh, three years ago. So here it's already <coughs> written. So um, you take gamma, some non-trivial class, and for now it's restricted to the sphere, uh, but in arbitrary co-dimension. Um, and you have this beta gamma. Uh, then there exists. Um, so phi 1, phi m, which are uh, branched one more spheres, one more, uh, more spheres, such that you, c you realize the width. That is, it's the sum of the energy of the phi j. So here, as in algorithm pit theory, you have some multiplicity which doesn't come from the immersion, but you may have multiple uh, branched immersions realizing it. And the branch points, um, so branch point uh, uh, in a conformal parameterization. So if z is a conformal coordinate, um, so phi of z looks like uh, the same definition almost as in algebraic geometry, so theta 0 plus 1, where uh, theta 0 is an integer. And um, normally in algebraic geometry, we would say that if theta 0 is at least 2, it has a branch point of order theta 0 minus 1. 
But here, uh, as we may have logarithmic singularities, as uh, for example, if you invert the catenoid, I will also speak occasionally of branch points of order one. But uh, that's the only thing. Um, so now to have a chance to uh, make some progress on this general problem, one might uh, want to get some information on, on the index of these ones, of, of these uh, surfaces. And for example, if we knew that they were immersions, then as you're an inversion of a minimal surface, we'll see at the end of the talk that, that uh, it might be possible to compute the mass index. And so the first thing that we would like to know if does uh, Brian's theorem um, extend to the case of branch points? And so, sorry, so I don't, so for on the regular theorem, mm -hmm. then gamma is always zero? Uh, sorry. And gamma you put there on the virus transfer representation to say that the expansion is um, phi hat is the real part of something plus some letter, is that a gamma? Oh uh, yeah, it's a gamma, right. Gamma times log. Mm -hmm. So in the ones that so we can get, there's no gamma. I mean, because the branch points may be of any order, a priori. You may have, for example, inversion of the NPS surface. It's not excluded. I mean, as we have branch points, it means, I mean, first, we don't know that we are in inversion of a surface until the, the expansion looks like something like this at branch points. Right. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's two different things. If we know that we are in immersion, an immersion from the sphere, then by Brian's theorem, you have the inversion of a minimal surface, which has this expansion that at the end, right? And so here, this must be equal to 0. But in this theorem, we have just branch, branch rule spheres. We don't know their inversions of minimal surface in, surfaces in general. And, uh, and then you have uh, singularities, which look like this. And uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's quite similar to the work of Muller and Ferrac from the 90s, where uh, surfaces of finite curvature. So if mm -hmm. you compose that with an inversion, then they don't have to be minimal. A priori, they are not minimal surfaces, right? Yeah. Um, because I will discuss it now here, because uh, you see everything was relying on Riemann-Roch, right? And and actually, when you have branch points, this uh, Cartier colomorphic form seems to have poles. So this is what I'm going to discuss now. Um, so it's a, it's a theorem of Lam and uh, and Engrian. Sorry. from 2015. So if uh, phi, um, so I write R3, but the result would work. OK, let's my, my, me write R3. Uh, is a branched um, will mass face. Then, uh, then this cartic form Q phi uh, may have poles. Uh, so I don't say that they have poles, but have poles of order uh, at most two. And one can show that it implies still by riemann hoch uh, that if you have some branch emissions from the sphere, and if phi has uh, Less than three branch points, branched uh, branch points. Um, then I will just write it like this: like duality holds. Uh, uh, by this I mean uh, Brian called this theorem a duality theorem. And by duality, I just mean that you are in the inversion of a minimal surface. And uh, for example, so you, you have essentially three possibilities: you have the the catenoid. Uh, which would correspond to two branch points. You have the NPS surface with one branch point of order three, and you have also the trinoid, so three kind of cat catenoid ends. And uh, right. Okay, but but now if you if you forget this theorem, uh, you say but okay, but it seems that I have branch points of order two, but here there are no branch points, so there must be some consolation somewhere in this cartic form. So. So we have to, uh, to get some explicit formula for this cartic form. And uh, um, 
So first, how, how do you define uh, this, uh, uh, this chaotic form? Um, so, uh, so as we saw previously, the same to look at two more surfaces in R3 or S3. So let me consider some immersion into S3. Then uh, it's apparent uh, we defined some uh, conformal ghost map. So it goes to sigma into uh, the theta space, which is R5 with some Lorentzian metric. And, uh, and so the theorem is to say that uh, phi is Wilmore if and only if uh, this map is, uh, is harmonic. So we don't really need this, but it's a striking parallel with minimal surfaces. So you are minimal in R3 if and only if the Gauss map is harmonic into S2. And here we have a force of problem, and here it becomes of dimension 4, but with a uh, with a Lorentzian metric. And this, uh, how do you define this Q phi? Then it's just defined as follows. That is, you take, you just take derivatives of this, of this function. So it's this cartic form uh, with respect to the uh, Lorentzian metric. And um, so this is uh, our first uh, result on the subject with uh, Tristan Rivière uh, is to give an expression of this form, and it's the following. So g minus 1 times uh, del del bar of h0 times h0 minus del h0 del del bar h0 um, plus 1 fourth of 1 plus h square h0 to the square, where uh, H0 is uh, the uh, of differential. The uh, of differential. And let me point out that this term, we can write it formally as H0 to the square, and then delta bar of log of H0. And one can plug in, for example, if H0 is a product of, of um, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic function, then this vanishes. And, um, and so, so we come to the next theorem. This is from 2017. Um, so um, if uh, Phi, uh, yeah, to uh, R3 is a true Wilmore surface. I will define it in a minute. True Wilmore uh, sphere. Then, uh, then, um, then phi is uh, the uh, uh, inversion of a complete minimal minimal surface, so it should be with a finite total curvature, total curvature and uh, zero flux. And two, uh, uh, the psi j in uh, one, so here, uh, one, are uh, true uh, Wilmore surfaces. So it implies, in particular, that the width is quantized by 4 pi. Okay.
let me define what is I mean by true homospheres. Um, yeah. So if you remember the talk of Paul from uh, two weeks ago, it was a condition about residues of Wilmore. And uh, so for this, I need uh, another theorem to state it, um, which is now a classical theorem of Riviere. Um, um, so phi is uh, Wilmore if and only if uh, this uh, this form is cl closed and so what is this one form <coughs> is equal to zero um, okay so maybe I, I won't uh, I won't recall too much thing about about this theorem uh, because Paul talked to you about this last time. It was this condition with uh, divergence of t equal to zero, and then you define the, the residue as follows um, at some point p, and you just take the let me write this one form as uh, alpha. Then this residue is just imaginary part of the integral of alpha where I have a surface here. So I have a branch point P here. And I take gamma, a close contour. And um, yes, so we want to have this always equal to 0. And we're saying that in this min-max theorem, we have it equal to 0. And, and also, uh, an interesting thing is that if phi is uh, the inversion of a minimal surface with, uh, with phi minimal, then uh, this first residue is also equal to uh, the flux of this uh, dual surface, which would correspond to the coefficient gamma in the, expe in the expansion right there, up to a constant. And that's why if you have a true branch homosphere, which is the inversion of the minimal surface, the minimal surface cannot have flux. For example, the inversion of the catenoid is not admissible here. So sorry, so let's understand. So what what is the definition of a true Wilmore sphere? So a true Wilmore sphere, sorry. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, so um, Want to have this residue? Yeah. So it's a uh, yeah. Okay. So, so mm -hmm. sorry. So if we look at that as a Tosky expansion. Uh, there, so for example. So that is minimal surface <laughs> and invert. Then. Uh, That's equivalent to say that the gamma is zero. Yes. Right. Exactly. So, but now the the issue that we may have, uh, if if phi is a minimal guy, it will be something like this with some uh, plus uh, with some integer m and for example the inversion of the n upper surface which has no flux is an admissible candidate in this min max right and uh, yes okay so let me discuss a bit about the proof um, So the only thing we need to, to, to do is to say, well, um, do we have actually poles? Because if we can remove these poles, uh, then we have the theorem by Bryant. I mean, that is, if we can show that this Kartic form, even if it, if it seems to have poles of order two, if we can remove these poles, then we're, we're done. 
And, and here, that's why we have this technical condition, uh, true will more, which actually we j only need for multiplicity equal to 1, 2, and 3, but it's a technical thing. Um, so, so, well, yeah. so let's see if I understand that mm -hmm. theorem. So the theorem is that, so the first statement is if it's a true will more sphere, the, then this quartic form is holomorphic, and so oh, you're okay. you using. Then this quartic form is holomorphic. Then yeah. Then right. And the second statement is that the ones obtained by min max satisfy this. Form. Exactly. And uh, maybe I don't have much time to discuss about the proof, but if you remember the uh, Paul Laurent's talk from two weeks ago, you had these three residues that you got from Nutter's theorem, and actually you had the fourth one from inversions, and you can see that. Uh, you, you can you can compute how they transform when you apply inversions, and you, know, you can compute explicitly that all these radius use must vanish, and so you, you get you get this kind of theorem. But I, I don't. Yeah, mm. and the integer n is what is the number of n's multiplied. By so I mean here in this case it would be um, right. Uh, so here you you should uh, use uh, the Hogamid formula. Uh, so if you have uh, n uh, p1 uh, pn of uh, multiplicity uh, uh, m1 and n, then your 4 pi times the degree of this more energy of uh, times the degree of the Gauss map, which you can compute as something like, in general, it's, some, it's genus minus 1. Uh, plus uh, plus the sum one half of n j plus one. Right. So we can compute explicitly. And uh, maybe I should not speak about this because it's a bit technical. But you here in this theorem, you also allow interior branch points uh, for this dual minimal surface, and this will still be a multiple of four pi. Okay, so proof. Um, okay, I, I won't discuss uh, uh, Montiel's theorem that holds in R4, but actually our theorem of removability works in any co-dimension, and uh, I can define. You see, I can define this uh, this tensor as follows, uh, and it's about uh, this guy that we actually prove a theorem. Uh, with a vectorial one, so you just need to replace it by uh, with normal derivatives. Um, yeah. And uh, let me remark that uh, so this works in any dimension, and if if you're minimal, then this guy is, is holomorphic, is a holomorphic section, and h is equal to zero, and so you recover the the Cartic form considered by Calabi in his classical work from 1967 about uh, minimal spheres in spheres. And uh, so the first step is to okay, use, uh, use uh, the conformality of phi. That is just uh, this relationship. And then you can already uh, re reduce the order of the poles. And then you see directly that q phi as poles of order uh, at most one. So here we assume that we have a true, true in most sphere. And uh, our Wilmore surface, it, it's, it's just about the Taylor expansion of at branch points. And let me remark it that by uh, riemann hoss theorem, so it's the last time I use it, uh, it shows that uh, you have duality if uh, Phi as uh, less than seven branch points. Um, so now you can start believing that the result uh, may be true because with three points, it's three points you can just use a conformal group to put them wherever you want. But seven branch points, it shows that yeah, you have something non-trivial happening, and uh, and so now I mean to finish the proof. There are uh, two arguments. So, 
So the first one is to say, okay, but now let's expand this this um, this Q phi to see what we get, and uh, and so okay. So first, <laughs> let me mention that that phi uh, you can expand it uh, at any order at branch points, and it's due to uh, Bernard and Riviere from 2013. Uh, even if you're not smooth at branch points, so it's a technical point, but so Q of phi, uh, you can expand it as follows. So theta 0 is the order of branch point. So first, you have some harmony coefficients. Um, and then you have the first non-trivial one, which is this one, this coefficient, plus a higher doctor. And now you can expand Q. So A1, C1. So here it's this guy is Euclidean. Even if these coefficients are complex uh, numbers. So you have your pole of order one, and uh, and actually you see there are non-trivial um, anti-holomorphic coefficients. So by this I mean that plus uh, uh, a one c one minus. Okay, and times this and plus okay, uh, sorry about this. Uh, Plus something. Okay. So. Um, oh, maybe I should not have erased. Okay. Let me go here. Um, First, let me assume that theta 0 is at least 5. You can check that it works, uh, that uh, Q phi is uh, holomorphic uh, for low multiplicity. And, and so, OK, so you have two coefficients which are, uh, which are not holomorphic. But this uh, tensor, you assume that it's, it's holomorphic. So you have two constellations here. And I can rewrite it. Uh, with the following matrix. So I define this matrix M. So it should be uh, A bar. And the identity that you have is that M times A1 C1 times A1 A1 is equal to 0. And now we can compute this determinant of m. And uh, we see by Cauchy-Schwarz that it's a non-negative quantity, minus a1. OK, so it's fine. Just positive. So if the if, uh, determinant of m is positive, then we are done. And uh, if, uh, if this guy is equal to 0, then uh, a1, c1 are proportional. Right. And it will allow us to finish the proof. Now assume that this is this holds. And, uh, and so we need to find another relationship. And um, it will come from the conservation laws, uh, so from the one uh, which comes from inversions that uh, Paul mentioned uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it's a following. So we have this uh, conservation law. As 
associated to uh, inversions. And I still have alpha written here, so, so it's this following. So alpha minus 2 phi alpha phi. And you have some other factor. And plus. is equal to 0. And, and now, if you expand your function of high enough order, look at this coefficient, and you find that it's equal to uh, to something which will allow you to finish the proof. So it implies a theorem. Um, yeah, so I can make a, a um, can make a break now uh, because it's the end of the proof, uh, or I can start the next the next part. Um, you prefer to make a break now, or yeah. okay? Right. So now we want to uh, discuss about the mouse index. So first, let me uh, try to make a picture. Uh, Something like this. Yeah, not so sure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Now assume that this guy is a is a branch Wilmore sphere. Uh, or Wilmore surface doesn't change. So um, as we saw at branch points, there are some singularities because uh, this, this minima, this, uh, as a branch point, it looks like this. Um, so the metric, uh, if I write just this metric, looks like some constant with lambda different from 0 uh, times z to the 2 theta 0 minus 2. And, uh, and if you remember, the, in general, the definition of index, most index, just look at uh, subspace where the second derivative is, uh, is negative, and you look at the supremum dimension of these subspaces. But if you have singularities, then it's not clear that uh, you may have, what I mean here is that you may have uh, continuous ways to deform your surface for which you cannot compute the second derivative. And so let me, let me explain it here. Um, that uh, I could define uh, uh, the index as follows. Uh, let's take L equal to 0 or 2, full more of phi. So we have some full more branch full more surface. Guys, okay, so a branch full more. So you may define it as a um, so supremum of the dimension of V where v is in the natural uh, uh, space of, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So let's do it. I just mean the variations along uh, along phi. Um, so if, uh, yes, so if l is equal to 2. Um, where uh, the second derivative um, is negative uh, for all w. Um, but this, you, you would like to define it for w and in general, if you have branch points, and if you just take a w to 2 intersected with Lipschitz variation, these things may not be well defined. And, and so you might also define uh, just space of uh, zero variation of phi, and you would define it as like this. So 
So you just take the derivative at zeros of pass, um, where uh, phi zero is phi, and the Wilmo energy of phi t is less than the Wilmo energy of phi uh, for all t different from zero. And then you could define the, uh, the index 0 of phi, where you just look at continuous pass. And it's the same definition here, but with no second derivative. And uh, I want to, uh, to argue that this 0 index in general cannot be computed. And when I write index, I mean this two index here. So let me. Um, um, uh, yes, I mean, we have to, to consider variations which are not completely supported outside of range points. That's why. And uh, so you, you, could, uh, you could define uh, the admissible space like var2 of phi, and you take the, the subspace like. Um, um, Uh, such that uh, this map uh, is, uh, is C2 and uh, and uh, yes um, so I'm, I'm just mean that if you C2 then it's the same with this then you can define this two index by looking at these two variations and uh, um, you get an, an easy uh, condition, which is as follows. Um, uh, um, so. so you are an admissible variation if and only if. Uh, so two conditions. So the gradient is in an infinity. And uh, I take normal variations. The normal Laplacian is in L2 with respect uh, to the symmetric. And if I look here, what does it mean? Um, if W uh, is from the disk into Rn, it means that d phi divided by z to the theta 0 minus 1 is in L infinity. And uh, the Laplacian divided by z to the theta 0 minus 1 is in L2 with respect to the flat metric. So I mean, the, the largest space where you can define the second derivative is this space. And uh, um, um, it, it uses the explicit formula for the second derivative. I can't write it because it's quite long. But uh, for example, uh, this would be something like for the, the Jacobi operator, plus here the Simons operator. plus lower order terms. And here, uh, when the metric is singular, then you get this condition of L2. And you, also, you can also get this condition here. Um, do you have questions about this? Um. So is it clear that uh, this is different from just looking at those regular points? Just Sorry? Um. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand your definition of, of index. Um, I'm saying you. Um, yeah, but if you want to look at the differential on the index with branch points, then these variations are not necessarily compactly supported yeah. outside of branch points, uh, as we will see uh, a bit later. So, so a priori, we cannot. <coughs> yes, we, we cannot just take the supremum away from branch points. Yeah. And so we just, if you want to define it with a second derivative, and we say, OK, let's look at just where well, this is negative. And you look at the maximal subspace of the natural space of variations where you can define this. And then you get this condition. That's why. So when I write index, I mean this index. Um, and so. So the next theorem says that 
we can realize uh, okay this uh, we already know that we can realize this uh, min max width so uh, it's a gamma So we already know by Rivia theorem that they exist. Uh, so now they are true. Uh, uh, phi 1, phi n, such that. Uh, so the width is realized. And uh, and you get the index bound. The sum of indices is less than k. So it's it it's the same as uh, the ungram uh, uh, min max theorem, but you can realize it, and it's bounded by the number of parameters. And by index here, I mean this index, right? And uh, I won't make too much comments on the proof, but. Uh, for the PD point of view, it's based on uh, the viscosity method. Viscosity. Um, so we have a lot of uh, different uh, theories of min-max for min-max surfaces, and grand pits, uh, Galen can, and here we need to use something else to get this bound. And uh, okay, uh, so I won't discuss the proof of this theorem because it's a bit technical. But now I'd like to um, to justify. All this work to say that one may be able to compute the index of inversions of minimal surfaces. So it's the following theorem. And for simplicity, let me state it uh, in the case of uh, immersions. So let uh, okay, let psi be uh, with more immersion. Then uh, there exists uh, a matrix uh, um, um, so size n. Where uh, n is a number of n's of the dual minimal surface uh, matrix lambda um, such that uh, for all a in uh, Rn, there exists some variation w22 of s2. So by this I mean. I have a normal variation. Um, such that uh, V of P1, V of Pn is equal to A1, An, if uh, phi is uh, the uh, inversion of. Uh, so this minimum surface with n ends. Uh, so there is third variation uh, such that the uh, the second derivative of the Wilmore energy uh, uh, at V is equal to uh, 12 pi times the sum of lambda ij. Vpi, Vpj, with i different from j, and uh, so it implies that the index is less than n minus one. Okay, so what's written here? I take a, a Wilmore immersion. I look at the dual minimal surface with n the number of n. Then you have a matrix such that the index is equal to the index of this matrix. This is the number of negative eigenvalues. So, um, 
by by immersion you allow for branch points or you so so f here I stated for immersions and in general uh, you have also uh, you can also write this uh, this formula but with uh, with end will be the number of ends of the dual minima surface so for example for the n upper surface uh, this would be zero but um, but as we'll see there might be another coefficient and uh, for example, for the, for the catenoid, here you have a matrix with zero di diagonal, but for the catenoid, you would add uh, the flux on the diagonal, so it would increase the index. So, uh, for example, for, for the catenoid, I think that uh, the index you can write like um, uh, would be uh, I mean, the index of is. Uh, is index of a matrix like this, uh, Q of 16 pi. Uh, 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 where beta uh, is the flux and uh, lambda is some real number. And uh, for now, I, I cannot uh, compute the, the lambda j. Um, so for the Brian sphere, the one of 16 pi, mm -hmm. so the result says what? That the index is less, so then f n is going to be four? Uh, yes, so the index and is... the index has to be equal to n three, but you expect to be one, no? I mean, it's expected to be one, but at the same time, one would expect that the index grows linearly in the number of n's. And, uh, and um, let me mention that uh, we'll see in the proof that how do we obtain this lambda ij? Then uh, we obtain them by uh, uh, by solving some uh, some PDE, and uh, and there are some uh, logarithmic growth of, of functions, and um, if we look at spheres, for example, uh, you see that this lambda ij uh, will not depend, for example, of the distance between the points here, mm -hmm. bj, and uh, um, so you have the impression that there are, there should be some universal number, and and if the index m grows linearly in n. Then also the lambda j must be equal and must be positive, and then you get the matrix with zero diagonal and one everywhere, which is n minus one. But for now, I, I don't know if the index is one, two, or three. I mean, it may be stable too, but it's not expected. So I'm still trying. So the statement is big, so I'm still trying to read it. So you say that you to look at the number of bands and mm -hmm. then what is such that you could you read that again? I'm trying to. Yeah, read yeah. It. Uh, so uh, what of that? let's say we have n ends. Then uh, there exists a matrix such that the second derivative is equal to uh, Where's the matrix? Uh, this oh. matrix lambda oh. here, okay. which only depends on phi. And then the index is equal to the index of this matrix here. Right. 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 And I think that you can realize all values here. Yeah. And that's why if you, if you have a branch minima surface, I mean a branch room sphere, then you would al also have something like this, but you may have other coefficients coming from, the, from uh, for example, from the flux. So, on the form is the second variation. Yes. Second. It will apply to some vector. I would assume that's v comma d. Yes. Equals twelve pi, and then what is the thing on on the right hand side? So it's a sum before i different than j of yeah. lambda ij. Of the quadratic form. Yes. One is w. I don't know. Can uh, v of pi, v of pj. So if you have a negative direction in that matrix, in yes. the quadratic form, why isn't that identity giving you a, neg a negative direction for the Wilmot energy on the deformation? Um, oh, I see. It's exactly the same. It's the exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's, it's, it's really equal. And, but the best you can know is that at most you have. Yeah. One yeah. Because for, I, 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 for now, I can't compute the lambda ij. But uh, yeah. Um, okay, let me discuss uh, uh, how much do we have left. Okay, uh, let me discuss uh, some elements of proof. So, and sorry, yes, um, sure, sure. And for the enamel, what is that matrix? Okay, so that's very interesting because uh, um, okay, we'll see later that there's a general formula which gives you what you want here, mm -hmm. but the issue is that if you get a branch point of order m you need to make a Taylor expansion of order 2m plus 1. And uh, for example, I, I could check for multiplicity 2 that, uh, that you can compute it. And I think you can always compute it. But uh, 
what, what it means is that for, for n a pair, uh, you, have no, you have only one n, so you have no cross terms here. But you, you have something like this here. You may have plus, I mean, you have some coefficient here, lambda times v square of pi. Uh, that, uh, of phi is equal to this. And you should just determine the sign of this. What's that? Um, um, Sorry, um, uh, um, so, for example, so for an pair, uh, I have not finished the computation yet. Uh, but the index should be equal to 0 or, or 1. Because uh, here, we, we won't have these cross terms here. But in the computation, you, you may have a term quadratic in v of p. And th actually, the, the fact that you have no coefficient on the diagonal is exactly because you have no flux here. And, uh, and here, uh, for example, for the catenoid, you get something on non 0. For, for example, for the catenoid, so the index may be uh, uh, it may be stable, or the index may be equal to 1. I don't know. Um, but for the NPR surface, after you do your computation, you, you just need to determine what formula you get here. And uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe I mean, we'll, we'll see it on the explicit formula, that what we get. Um, right. Um, so elements of proof. So, uh, so recall that uh, um, that this quantity um, is uh, is pointwise uh, conformally invariant. Okay, and. Uh, so it implies that, uh, let me define also uh, another Wilmore energy, which is just the integral of h squared minus k. So this part works for, uh, OK, let me restrict to s2, but it doesn't change anything. Um, yeah. And uh, for a smooth immersion, then if you look at the index respect to this function, or just x squared is the same, because this will just be a constant. And, uh, but it implies that if, if uh, you take a variation phi t um, plus t uh, uh, v, where v is a, is a normal variation of, um, so here it was psi, sorry, uh, yeah. um, and of psi, um, then the the second derivative, I mean, the, what it is, is just the derivative, second derivative at 0 of this function. So this is a uh, definition. It's the same uh, as this. Then it's also the second derivative of, uh, of uh, so some of was psi. Uh, um, so at t equal to 0. And uh, and you can check that if uh, phi t is that the variation that you get is the following. Uh, so it's equal to uh, phi square v times the normal of phi, right? And uh, and now I mean, we need to compute the second derivative of this of this function for minimal surface. So the first term from h square is clear because as h is equal to zero, you just need to derive h two times, and so you get the Jacobi operator. And uh, and then the second derivative of minimal surface. So at this variation, uh, we call it u and psi of uh, u, u, it's equal, so here is the integral on sigma, uh, minus, so sorry, it's s2, um, p1, pn. Um, so you have one half of uh, the Jacobi operator of u. Um, and, 
And then you have a second term from the Gauss curvature. Normally, uh, if you take the first derivative as it's constant, it's equal to zero. But here, we have a non-compact surface. So we have a non-trivial term, which is the following, minus d times, so it's exterior derivative. So we have 2 times uh, uh, Laplacian of u plus. OK, maybe I should, I should write it uh, somewhere else. OK, uh, kg uh, u del u minus del du uh, g to the square. Right. And, and this will be, uh, yes, so the second derivative will be equal to this. And we cannot just neglect this term because we have a non-compact surface. Um, so what, what, what do, you give, do you get in this case? Um, so it means that uh, d2w uh, of uh, psi with respect to this variation here, so for all v in w22 of s2, we take this normal variation here. So it's equal to uh, this integral, sorry, of uh, one half of Lg of u and minus uh, d of some uh, one form u of u, uh, which is written there. And uh, let me recall that Lg is a, is a Jacobi operator of your minimal surface. And Jacobi operator. Right. Uh, so I should write S2 minus P1 Pn. Okay, so now we can use, we want to use a Stokes theorem. So the picture is as follows. Um, so I have this ends here. What I can do, OK, now I, I just fix some, some open coverings here. And I look at uh, charts, so in D2. So this F1 of U1 is equal to D2 into C. And, um, and phi1 of P1 is equal to 0. Um, then we, let, me, let me point out that we already know that this integral converge, right? Because it's really equal to this quantity, which is finite. And in general, if you, if you remember the, this condition here about branched immersions, it would still work if V is an admissible variation in this sense. That is, if you take a normal variation satisfying this condition, then this formula is still true because this is well defined. So you can run the same. But for simplicity, I will. I will stick to the case of multiplicity equal to one of n's. Okay, and now by I can define uh, sequences of balls, and I just uh, pull back uh, the Euclidean ball of radius uh, epsilon uh, for all i. Okay. Let me also, uh, also uh, mention uh, that this u, it's, it's phi square v, so it will blow up at n's, because phi is like 1 over z. Uh, but now uh, what we have is that the, the second derivative, um, let me write this for simplicity as q phi of v, then uh, q phi of v is a limit when epsilon goes to zero of so the Jacobi operator on uh, S2 minus the union of these balls. So now it's a finite quantity. And then uh, I use Stokes theorem plus, so I have a change of orientation of this integral here, omega of u. Now I can compute explicitly that uh, the integral is equal to um, 
for pi alpha I square right by epsilon 2 v2 of pi where uh, where you write phi of z as the real part of this and uh, and so alpha i square is one half of a zero to the square so it should be a minus right um, Let, let me uh, let me mention a uh, remark that if, for example, phi, uh, let's assume that it has some cateno um, catenoid n, then uh, um, this you would have to add some other term than this quantity. So we would still f get the first. And then you would have another term coming from the, this, this singular behavior. Um, I squared uh, up to a factor log of 1 over epsilon plus uh, 16 pi beta I square v2 of pi. So you see that adding. Um, adding logarithmic growth at ends tends to increase the index because you have this positive uh, direction here. So let me forget about this. But it explains the, the formula that we have here. Uh, so now the index of uh, is exactly equal to this limit. Uh, okay, let me mention that this works if, if V is uh, at least C2. Um, it's this limit of one half of S2 minus um, minus the sum. Right, and so you get the first index bound by this because if uh, v of pi is equal to zero for all i, then this vanishes, and because we know that this limit exists, then it implies that q phi of v is exactly equal to uh, this integral, which is finite in particular. So what does it show? It shows that the index of, um, of psi is at most n, right? So I said that this formula only works if the variation is C2. But now uh, let, me, uh, let me precise that this bound works in general, because if you take v in w22 of s2, which vanishes at the point, um, then if you take uh, some sequence vj in, uh, with uh, vj going to v in w22, then obviously this, this quantity converges. And so you get by, uh, by Fatulema that uh, Q phi of V is larger than the, this integral. Which is positive. So the index is less than number of ends um, for the weakest possible notion of variations. Uh, so here I use a, uh, you use Sobolev embedding, like W22 of S2 embeds in C0. And it also explains you why 
or in this formula, uh, it can only depend on the on the value of the variation at the point and not its higher derivatives. Because this, uh, for example, this expression here, one can see that it's it's continuous uh, just for w two two, like on the on the boundary here, uh, right? Okay, so uh, okay, so now we want to analyze uh, this quantity here rather than taking the, the points all equal to zero. And, uh, and for those who worked on, uh, on Gensburg-Landau, then when you see this kind of energy here with the logarithm, uh, it's, you, you see that this quantity is a renormalized energy, and you already know what is the singular term that you need to remove. So now uh, you want to do some analysis to, to understand this. Uh, this quantity, so fix, uh, fix epsilon positive uh, small enough, uh, small enough. Then uh, by result of smell, um, there exists a, a unique solution of uh, of the following problem that is Lg square of uh, unique solution of so it should be equal to zero. Uh, you epsilon i, and you give uh, directly plus uh, Neumann conditions is equal to d nu of phi square v, and here it's some. Did you fix some little epsilon zero, and and you want to to understand this quantity that is. You want to make appear this singular term, and the thing which will remain are this lambda ij. Okay, so it's it's the same result as for um, as for geodesics, the, the the existence of conjugate points, and if you take uh, epsilon small enough, then you have no nullity of this operator, and uh, well, you can you can solve uniquely, and uh, now you can prove uh, that. Uh, um, that one half of um, directly energy u epsilon i to the square that it's exactly equal to this uh, singular term. It also works for uh, uh, when you have a logarithm, but let me stick to this case. Okay, so yeah, yes. Um, so now what you can do is to, uh, to compute. Yeah. Let me define uh, for simplicity uh, Q epsilon of uh, W to be the half one half of the integral on S two minus the union of of the small disk of uh, LG of W to the square. And then this term here, that is Q epsilon of U, I write it as Q uh, epsilon of U minus the sum of U epsilon I. I define it to be U epsilon plus the sum of this term. Now, if you expand this, what you get is, well, you have q epsilon of u epsilon plus the sum from i equal 1 to n of q epsilon of u epsilon to the i plus cross terms. So plus the sum of the integral on, uh, yeah. We also define s2 epsilon to be uh, s2 minus this little disks. Um, uh, so it's to epsilon, so I will have uh, LGU epsilon epsilon i. Uh, plus the sum from i different than j.
So first, let's, let me remark that uh, here we already captured this singular term. So the rest will be bounded quantities. And, um, and one can show uh, uh, by what is called uh, an initial root analysis. Uh, that uh, um, that u epsilon i, it's singular. You see, the metric is singular at all points, right? So you can expand it as follows, and the worst singularity will be a logarithm plus, uh, and here it will be, uh, let's say, in in u j, that is in in the neighborhood of p j, and in particular, this coefficient a i j does not depend on the chart. And now you can, you can integrate by parts, right? And you find that the integral on S2 epsilon of Lg u epsilon i, Lg u epsilon j, is equal to um, minus 4 pi aij. Pj plus some error in epsilon, and this is also equal because you just integrate by part. You can, I mean, the two are let's say by Jacobi fields, right? So you can integrate in one way and the other, and here it will be a gi. So here it's always from j different than i, than i v of pi. So what it, it implies? It implies that. Uh, there exists some lambda ij in R such that uh, um, u epsilon i is equal to lambda ij uh, vpi um, log of z. Uh, so here in uj, right? Now that we have this expansion, likewise, you show that the integral of Lg u epsilon and g u epsilon i is equal to um, 8 pi times the sum with g different than i. And here you will have lambda ij vpi vpj plus some error. And now, if you put everything together, you see that uh, this integral here, um, so s to epsilon of L g of u, it's equal to um, four. So you have first this uh, q epsilon of u epsilon, where this guy is bounded, plus our singular terms. So here you have 8 pi, and here you have minus 4 pi, so we'll have plus 4 pi times the sum of lambda ij vpi vpj i different than j. And uh, you can see that this u epsilon i um, is, a, uh, is at most uh, a logarithm, logarithm, logarithm at, at end. So this guy will go to certain u0, uh, which is at most uh, uh, with a logarithmic singularity. So it implies that this, this function, um, which I write v epsilon, it's something like a big O of z2 log of z uh, at ends. And so we saw here in this formula, uh, which is here, that if we take a w22 variation v, which vanishes at ends, this integral if, is finite. So, so what we get, so uh, once we remo remove this quantity, 
et that the second derivative, so this uh, q phi of v is equal to uh, a certain, um, so just this integral, uh, one half of uh, Lg of u0, which is finite, plus 4 pi times this term. It's i different than j. So here, uh, yes. So it, it implies directly that the index is at most n minus 1, right? And so now we want to get rid of this term to see that the index is really equal to the one of this matrix. And, uh, and our Jacobi fields are actually already given. Because now we can use, we can use this uh, u epsilon i in the following way. If I define uh, uh, v epsilon i to be u epsilon i divided by phi square, this guy is goes to a certain uh, v zero i in w to two log outside of the points. Uh, so this guy is really in w to two of the full surface, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, but in, ge in general, this guy is not in C2. And uh, so now we can say that we have an important property that V0 of Pi is still equal to V of Pi. And uh, V0 of Pj is equal to 0, because it looks like something like this. So now we can say, OK, let's take V0 to be the sum of Wi. I call 1 to n. And uh, so this guy is a, is a non-less variation. And uh, in particular, this, this uh, and notice that Lg square of phi square v0 is equal to 0 on s2 minus, uh, minus all these points. Um, And uh, I said at some point that uh, this formula uh, that I erased now, uh, which, which was giving us uh, the residue, so th this integral here, uh, imaginary part of I said that it was equal to um, uh, minus 4 pi so this works if uh, v is in c2 and here this uh, this new v0 it has singularity of this form so it's still w22 but now uh, the interesting thing is that uh, if we we add this u0 now which is defined, uh, I mean, just this is u0 here. And so I adjust 0 here. Then you have another term, which will be, um, which, uh, yes, which is this term. Of lambda ij, dpi, dpj. So now we can redo the analysis. This will st still give you the, just this quantity and no constant term, which means that in the end, uh, q phi of v0, because now uh, you see this, uh, this quantity, uh, q epsilon of u epsilon, you can integrate by parts. And uh, because this guy satisfies this equation, so you can show that this new uh, q epsilon of u epsilon it's, uh, it vanishes when epsilon goes to 0. And so you find that this is equal to, um, to the previous term, which is the 4 pi times 
lambda ij vpi vpj plus, so we have one of these terms each time for all i to n, and then the sum 1 to n, which j different than i, of lambda ij vpi vpj, which is what we want, which is uh, 12 pi lambda ij vpi vpj. Okay. Okay. I think I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs>